Chief Justice, may it please the court. I'm Amy Swearer. And I'm Giancarlo Conaparo. And welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. Welcome to another episode of SCOTUS 101. Howdy, howdy, howdy. We have a lot to talk about this week, so without any further chit-chat, let's get right to it. We had four opinions out this week, two big ones, so we're going to get right to them after Amy updates us about the cases that the court did not take up. Lost in all of the Monday hubbub over the court's opinion release and then the resulting crash of the Supreme Court website was the reality of what the court declined to take up for the next term. Despite having a slew of Second Amendment cases to choose from, and despite also having four justices who have recently signaled a desire for the court to take up a Second Amendment case, the court instead denied certiorari in all of the 10 pending Second Amendment cases remaining on its docket. This is incredibly disappointing for a lot of people and seems to suggest that this is not a matter of the court simply waiting for the right opportunity. Rather, it seems to be at this point that the four other conservative justices are not very sure what Chief Justice John Roberts would do in such a Second Amendment case. I think the $10 million question is, why isn't Roberts telling at least his colleagues enough that they can decide to take up a case or not? Yeah, to me, the thing that makes the most sense is not necessarily... Uh, that anyone suspects Roberts has rethought his positions in Heller or McDonald uh, since he joined those without reservation. Instead, it seems at this point, uh, it's probably a matter of him wanting to avoid the politics of overturning gun control laws on a 5-4 decision. Uh, He's certainly one for institutional concerns and and how people view the court. Mm. Um, So it seems to me that he might be waiting for a judicial unity case Uh, like what they would have had, presumably, in New York Pistol and Rifle, where I think it was likely at least one or two liberal justices would have considered voting uh, in the majority in that case on the merits. And that's also uh, what happened in the Caetano case, which is the only Second Amendment case the court has taken up since 2010. But the problem is that given the court's current composition, you're really not likely to get a judicial unity case that meaningfully builds out the Second Amendment legal framework. Uh, And that's actually desperately what is needed right now in the lower courts. Um, So it's, again, disappointing, but I think that is the best way to make sense of this. Amy, a shameless plug. You actually just wrote an op-ed about this. Where can people find it? I did just write an op-ed about this. So if you want to dig into this a little bit uh, more deeply, we will post the link Uh, with the episode when it goes up. Now on to the moment you've all been waiting for, opinions. First up is Bostock. The issue in Bostock is whether discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity is discrimination because of sex, which is forbidden by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. The background in this case, it's actually three consolidated cases. All of the plaintiffs in these cases alleged that they were fired either because they were homosexual or because they were transgender. Justice Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion joined by the chief and the Democrat appointees holding that sexual orientation discrimination or gender identity discrimination is sex discrimination because it is, and I quote, impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without also discriminating against that individual based on sex. Now, GC, Gorsuch is known for being a textualist, and he's the one who wrote the opinion here. So how did textualism come into play? Uh, It was, or at least Gorsuch intended for it to be, the foundation to his opinion. So Gorsuch starts by laying out his textualist approach. He says textualism requires the court to interpret the statute in accord with the ordinary public meaning of its terms at the time of its enactment. So that's a good textualist start. It is. And he continues the way you'd expect, which is looking at the meaning of sex in 1964. And he concludes that it's undisputed that sex meant only biological distinctions between male and female. It does not cover or did not cover sexual orientation or gender identity. GC, so how does that conclusion not end the textualist discussion? 
Gorsuch says the question isn't just what sex meant, but also what Title VII says about sex. Specifically, he focuses on the words uh, that it forbids discrimination because of sex. To Gorsuch, that means that an employer violates Title VII when he fires an individual based in part on sex. To put it differently, he says, if changing the employee's sex would have yielded a different choice by the employer, a statutory violation has occurred. So, JC, how does that ultimate rule apply to the plaintiffs in this case? So Gorsuch takes that rule, and that leads us right into the crux of the opinion, which is Gorsuch says it is impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against that individual based on sex. So to support that conclusion, he offers an example. Two employees, one a man, the other a woman, are both attracted to men. If the employer fires the man for it, but not the woman, he's fired him in part because of his sex. So that, in a nutshell, is the majority opinion. Now, there are two dissents in this case, one by Alito, the other by Kavanaugh, and they are also purported to be textualist opinions. DC, can you explain how textualism created two different visions for this case that resulted in two very different outcomes for justices purporting to be textualists? Sure. So all three opinions agree that the text and not judicial imagination or legislative intent controls, but they disagree about how to assign the appropriate meaning to the text. Gorsuch takes a very literal approach. Alito and Kavanaugh reject this in favor of what Kavanaugh calls the ordinary meaning of the words. So for them, the fact that people who enacted the law never thought the word sex meant gender identity or sexual orientation controls. For Alito, Gorsuch's deviation from what everyone thought sex meant at the time of the enactment is the same as judicial activism to update an old statute for modern times. In a particularly colorful part of his opinion, he calls Gorsuch's opinion a pirate ship flying under a textualist flag, but actually representing judicial lawmaking. Kavanaugh takes a really exhaustive look at how sex has been defined in other judicial opinions and in the rest of the U.S. Code and says it really makes no sense if sex always meant, as Gorsuch says, sexual orientation and gender identity. None of these other laws and none of these other judicial opinions make any sense. It just isn't how we thought of sex until today. So, GC, that raises the biggest question. Who's right? Whose textualism is the right textualism here? So I think in the end, it's the dissenters, particularly Kavanaugh, who are correct. But before I explain why, let me make an important point about this case. A lot of people have already misunderstood this case as being about whether employment protections for homosexual and transgender people are good or bad policy. But that's not the issue. The issue is whether they exist in the law as it's written. So my objections to Gorsuch's opinion have nothing to do with the policy, only to the way in which he has interpreted the statute. Do you see, and I think that's a very important point because there there do seem to be a lot of headlines that have conflated these two things about, you know, whether this is good or bad policy or whether this was an issue about, you know, what does the law actually say and mean? Right. So in my view, in Determining what the law means, Gorsuch makes two mistakes. One is a matter of logic. The other is a matter of principle. The logic problem is, remember that the logical crux of Gorsuch's opinion is that it is impossible to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender discrimination without also discriminating on the basis of sex. To prove it, he used that example. Bob is fired for coming to the office party with John. Susie is not fired when she comes to the office party with John. Now, the reason he used that example is because he's trying to show that you can't separate sexual preference from biological sex. But he makes a logical mistake in that Bob and Susie, in his example, are not actually doing the same thing. And he hasn't isolated the role that sex plays. To isolate the role that sex plays, you have to use this example. Bob comes to the office party with John and is fired. Susie comes to the office party with Jill and is fired. 
that holds sex constant. And when you hold sex constant, you see it is possible to discriminate on the basis of sexual preference or gender identity and not on the basis of sex. Now, you mentioned that Gorsuch also gets it wrong on principle. Uh, What exactly do you mean by that? Sure. So for this, we have to think about what the point of textualism is. Why do we want judges interpreting the laws according to the meaning of the terms at the time they were written? We don't just do it for fun. The reason is it keeps unelected judges from overruling the will of the people by rewriting the laws. So even if we had concluded that Gorsuch's textualist method was correct, Gorsuch's textualism allows him to achieve an end that textualism is designed to prevent. That is, textualism is a tool to stop judges rewriting laws, and he has used it to rewrite a law. And if that is the result that textualism gets you when it's designed to avoid that, you must have done it wrong. It cannot work that way. So that's it for the legal analysis on Bostock. Amy, tell us about some of the practical implications for this case. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest practical implications that has come out uh, and the the biggest concerns that have been raised by the majority opinion are concerns about the impact on things like women's sports or scholarships designed to help women, the ongoing battles over the use of school locker rooms by members of the the opposite biological sex, um, and other sorts of protections generally afforded to biological women. And while this opinion dealt with Title VII and federal employment law, Uh, The issue seems to be that if sex is no longer linked to biology in federal employment law, um, certainly there's little reason to think it wouldn't also be considered unrelated to biology in the rest of federal law. Um, And so I think there's there's just a lot of concerns about how that plays out. I think also it's important to remember that Title VII and federal employment law still generally have the ministerial exemption doctrine which protects religious employers like like schools and churches. And the court actually has a ministerial exemption case this term that we're waiting uh, for an opinion with. So the holding in Bostock uh, presumably doesn't knock down any existing First Amendment protections. And also the court is likely to clarify some of those protections in the next couple of weeks. One last thing I want to say about Bostock before we move on to the DACA case, is there is an important jurisprudential implication for this case. To understand that, let me take you back in time to 1979 and the Supreme Court's decision in United Steelworkers of America. There, a private company had an affirmative action policy to increase the number of blacks in its workforce. The question before the court was, is that affirmative action policy discrimination on the basis of race, which, like sex, is prohibited by Title VII? The court looked at the text very much at the beginning of the opinion, like Gorsuch does here, and he and said, well, under the text, it certainly looks like it's discrimination. But the court did two things to get around it. It said, uh, we look at the intent behind the statute, and we look at the effect on groups, not individuals. So the intent of Title VII, the court said, was to help minorities, especially blacks in particular. So beneficial discrimination that helped the blacks as a group was permissible. But remember what the majority here in Bostock does. It says the text controls, the court may not look at intent, and the relevant inquiry is the effect on individuals. So United Steelworkers and Bostock are not compatible. They cannot be reconciled, which means that if affirmative action comes before the court again, and the justices who signed on to this majority opinion maintain integrity with what they wrote here, affirmative action is probably going to be struck down. This will be especially interesting to watch because Justice Sotomayor has come out in public and made several statements in support of affirmative action. I wonder, does she realize the implication of the opinion she joined in full on Monday? Yes, it'll it'll certainly be interesting to see whether she realizes that she may have just torpedoed uh, an affirmative action case by upholding a Title VII challenge in this way. And with that, let's talk about DACA. Amy, take it away. Yes, DACA. The second major opinion to come out this week was in Department of Homeland Security, the Regents of the University of California. These were actually, again, a series of consolidated cases challenging DHS's rescission of the Obama-era policy 
of Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, also known as DACA. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the majority opinion, joined in full by Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan, and in major part by Sotomayor. The majority held that DHS's rescission of the DACA policy is reviewable under the Administrative Procedures Act, and that the rescission was arbitrary and capricious under that act. It then remanded the case for DHS to consider the problem anew, essentially saying, try rescinding DACA again, but this time when you do it, explicitly consider the things our opinion tells you to consider. I think a lot of people are under the impression that this is about whether the Trump administration can actually rescind DACA at all. Yeah, exactly. I think there have already been a lot of bad hot takes out there already. Uh, As Chief Justice Roberts notes, uh, the dispute before the court is not whether DHS may rescind DACA, but whether the agency followed the proper procedures under the APA when it did so. So one of the things that the APA requires is that agency decisions be based on a consideration of the relevant factors and whether there has been any clear error of judgment. So that gives us sort of two main issues in this case. The the first was whether DHS's rescission of DACA was subject to judicial review in the first place, because the government tried to argue this isn't judicially reviewable. So the majority looks at this and said that it was, uh, essentially because the DACA program itself was not just a passive non-enforcement policy. Uh, It instead set up proceedings that conferred affirmative immigration relief. So its creation and rescission, therefore, were actions that provide for a a focus for judicial review. The second issue uh, after whether there can be judicial review is whether the rescission process violated the APA. So the majority first declined to consider additional DHS explanations issued in subsequent memorandum under DHS Secretary Nielsen. So it determined that the basic rule is clear, quote, an agency must defend its actions based on the reasons it gave when it acted. So it considered Nielsen's later memo, this impermissible post hoc rationalization that didn't match up with her predecessor's stated rationale. The majority then determined that the original DACA rescission memo failed to fully explain or consider a forbearance only policy that would have disallowed benefits for DACA recipients, but still would have extended the deferral of removal proceedings. It also, according to the majority, failed to consider recipients, quote, legitimate reliance interests on the original policy. So that was a mouthful, but I think it can all be sort of summarized in one of the final quotes from the majority, which is, quote, we do not decide whether DACA or its rescission are sound policies. The wisdom of those is none of our concern. We address only whether the agency complied with the procedural requirement that it provide a reasoned explanation for its action. Here, the agency failed to consider the conspicuous issues of whether to retain forbearance and what, if anything, to do about the hardship to DACA recipients. So, Amy, what part of that opinion did Sotomayor not join? So there was a a fourth part where a four justice plurality, so the majority minus Justice Sotomayor, concluded that the respondents in the case failed to establish uh, this plausible inference that DACA's rescission was motivated by animus and therefore violated the Fifth Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Sotomayor wrote a concurring opinion in which she explained that she would have permitted the respondents to further develop these equal protection claims on remand. Uh, she essentially disagreed with the majority's treatment of their allegations, given that the respondents were in a preliminary posture. So the question that I would love answered, and I think Thomas in his dissent touches on this, how can the Obama administration create a policy by memorandum that's unlawful, but the Trump administration can't rescind that same policy by memorandum? Right. So I think this was really, as you insinuated, the crux of the Thomas dissent, which was joined by Alito and Gorsuch. So they argued that the original DACA policy was patently unlawful. The Obama administration had no statutory authority to create that policy and, ironically enough, never went through the proper rulemaking process or was subject to the Administrative Procedures Act in the way that the court is subjecting this to the Administrative Procedures Act. 
Uh, so as they put it, quote, the decision to countermand an unlawful agency action is clearly reasonable. If the determination of illegality is sound, that's the end of our review. So essentially, they accuse the majority of erroneously holding not just that the agency is permitted, but that the agency is required to continue administering unlawful programs inherited from a previous administration. Uh, moreover, they point out that a remand here is pretty futile. No amount of policy explanation could cure the fact that DHS lacked statutory authority to enact DACA in the first place. And finally, they point out that this holding is actually going to hamstring future agency attempts to undo actions that exceed statutory authority. I think, to me, the most intriguing part of this dissent was actually the part where they had some fighting words that appeared to be aimed directly at the chief. They said, quote, today's decision must be recognized for what it is, an effort to avoid a politically controversial but legally correct decision. It accused the court of timidity uh, in its majority opinion, uh, forsaking the duty to apply the law according to neutral principles um, and, and essentially allowing the court to, to make political solutions and fight political battles that ought to be fought instead in the legislative branch. Well, it occurs to me that we'll probably be seeing a whole lot of 11th hour memoranda from the Trump administration in December. What do you think? Yeah. And, and speaking of uh, December and, and coming up on sort of the end of the year here, Alito also wrote a short dissent noting that between the nationwide injunctions and the court's current dictate that DHS just sort of try again, he points out that the federal judiciary effectively prevented DACA from being rescinded for an entire presidential term. And it did so without actually holding that DACA can't be rescinded. So essentially, the federal judiciary has said, you can rescind DACA, but we've prevented you from doing it for four years now, um, which is very, very interesting. I think finally, uh, Kavanaugh also wrote a shorter separate dissent. Uh, he said that while he appreciated the court's careful analysis, he disagreed with the treatment that the majority gave the later Nielsen memo. So he thought that this subsequent memo uh, expressly and reasonably addressed the reliance interests of the DACA recipients. And moreover, uh, he also pointed out that the practical consequences of the majority's decision is that they're just delaying the inevitable by requiring DHS to basically relabel and reiterate the substance of that memo that the court just said they're going to ignore. Well, those are the hot opinions this week. We've got two others that we'll just touch on briefly. Andrus, a per curiam opinion, the court ruled that when a criminal defendant's lawyer fails for no apparent reason to offer any mitigating evidence during the defendant's capital murder trial, the lawyer's assistance was defective. Doesn't uh, shock anyone, probably. Forest Service case, in an opinion by Thomas, joined by Roberts Ginsburg, except for one section, Breyer, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, the court held that the U.S. Forest Service may allow an energy company to build an underground pipeline within national forests traversed by the Appalachian Trail. Joining us for our interview this week is Judge David Porter of the Third Circuit. Judge Porter was nominated to the bench by President Trump and confirmed by the Senate in 2018. Prior to joining the Third Circuit, he litigated cases in private practice for many years with Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Judge Porter, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Now, Judge, sometimes on this show, we have advocates or judges where you can Google them and everything about their life and career pops up. But I got to be honest, one of the things I really love for our audience is to get to know judges where we don't otherwise you know, know a whole lot about them. Uh, and that's that's kind of the case here. So it's, it's kind of been difficult to find out a lot about you know, who, who you are and, and how your career got started. So I'm really excited uh, that you've taken the time to let us sort of dig in and get to know Judge Porter just a little bit better. So let's start okay. at the beginning. One of the, one of the more basic questions. Why law school? What started you down a legal career instead of something else? I would answer that by going back to college where I started as a biology major, but I had no idea what I really wanted to do. And about halfway through college, I had learned a couple things. First, I was a middling biology student. 
and I didn't find the labs and such very interesting. <laughs> uh, but I went to Grove City College. Grove City was and remains a true liberal arts college with a strong core humanities curriculum. And so the second thing I learned was that I, taking those core core classes, I loved theology and philosophy and English, basically anything that had a writing component and an historical perspective. Um, so that's sort of one thing. And then I graduated from college in 1988. And as you know, President Reagan appointed Justice Scalia to the Supreme Court in 1986 and nominated Judge Bork in 1987. And I had never paid any attention to the courts, but for some reason I became interested in those nominations and the whole confirmation process and the role of the judiciary in our system of government. So that confluence of events over a couple of years led to my thinking about law school. I didn't start right away. One reason was because my GPA wasn't very impressive, because as I said, I wasn't exactly hitting home runs as a biology student, but um, I went to DC and worked in a think tank for a year researching and editing and doing a little writing. And um, during that time, uh, you know, I kind of hit the reset button and it worked out well. I took the LSAT and then enrolled at George Mason University, which is now the Antonin Scalia Law That's School, right. yeah. where I had Judge I had Judge Bork for con law and had some other just fantastic professors like Henry Butler and Michael Krauss and Steve Eagle and the late Bobby Anthony. So I, I was very grateful for my years there in Arlington. And that's, you know, that's sort of the story. So you went from biology major to learning under Judge Bork. That, that's pretty amazing. That, that, that's pretty yeah. a, an amazing turnaround there. Now, so if you hadn't pursued a career in the law, I know you said you started with biology, but it doesn't sound like you, you might have continued with biology. If, if you didn't go to no. law school, what, what do you think you might have been doing instead? I, I really don't know. I, I think it would have been something involving lots of reading and writing, like I do in this job, but I don't know. You know, theology, philosophy, I liked economics, but um, I think the path I took was the right one. But it certainly sounds uh, as though that is the case. Um, now, you, after law school, you clerked for Judge uh, D. Brooks Smith while he was serving yeah. on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Uh, what can you tell us about that experience and what you learned from Judge Smith during that time? Well, you know, many people say their judicial clerkship was the best job they ever had in the law. And that was until I got this job, that was true for me, too. So I loved digging into the law and seeing how the the rules the procedural rules shape the evolution of a case. And I just learned from observation, you know, what made it for effective advocacy and then reading briefs and working with Judge Smith on opinion drafts helped shape my uh, legal, my thinking about legal writing and writing in general, and obviously gave me insight into how judges think about cases. So working with Judge Smith was a great treat. Uh, he was funny, smart, tough but fair, just a consummate professional. And, um, you know, one of the most important things I think I learned from him was his deep appreciation for the role of Article Three courts. He's a strong believer in the federal judiciary and rule of law. And I think that helped shape my own thinking. Judge, do you have any favorite memories uh, from your time with Judge Smith, this is something we, we tend to ask quite a bit, but it always just is interesting to see sort of what people remember the most. Um, so do you, do you have any favorite memories or, or things that really stick out from that experience? Um, well, I have a lighthearted memory and then probably a more serious one. I, um, in this same building where I now work, I was stuck in an elevator for about an hour uh, one day when it malfunctioned, and, I, and that's a memorable event. But um, we had over – there was a two-year clerkship, and um, Judge Smith was dividing his time between the Johnstown Division and Pittsburgh, and I was – my home base was in Pittsburgh, but I would go back and forth depending on um, if we had trials. So I would, I would say all of the trials that we had, uh, several civil trials and 
I think, more criminal trials. But those were the highlights. And then after you clerked for Judge Smith, you went into private practice at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Can you tell us a a little bit more about what type of law you focused on and and sort of what your your role there was and and how you developed in private practice? Well, the bulk of my practice was commercial litigation, and that's partly – that was partly – shaped by the mentors I had there, but I handled pretty much every kind of dispute that corporations and partnerships and sole proprietors can get into. Lots of breached contracts, uh, you know, business torts, cases involving uh, stolen trade secrets and breached covenants not to compete, uh, class action defense. So I did a lot of that kind of work. Um, I had an active First Amendment practice representing publishers and broadcasters and a higher education practice representing colleges and universities, you know, big um, research universities down to and and mid-sized universities down to small liberal arts colleges. And that was a lot of fun. I did some election law and represented the Republican caucus of the Pennsylvania legislature in constitutional matters, which was always interesting. And then for the last several years before taking this job, I had um, some huge class action, two class action cases and a related state court case in Southern California. So, uh, and that was environmental law. Uh, So it was uh, always interesting and I'm grateful for the opportunities I had there. So it sounds like you sort of became a jack of all trades, if you will, in, in, in a certain sense. Yeah, I mean, I had some of those specialties, First Amendment, higher ed, Mm -hmm. but as a commercial litigator, you you just need to know how to work up a case and try it if it goes to trial. And yeah, you kind of do become jack of all trades. George, were there any specific uh, cases or experience from private practice that you you think uh, stick out as sort of either the most interesting or um, just the most memorable from your years in, in private litigation? Well, any case that goes to trial sticks with you, and, and those are always great learning experiences. Um, I just I, I had a lot of cases around the country, and so it was um, interesting, and I always learned a lot going into different courtrooms, you know, around around the nation. So I think just having that geographic diversity was one of the most um, satisfying things. And you mentioned a little bit ago uh, some of the mentors that you you had along the way. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about those those mentors and and who they were and how they mentored you? Well, uh, well yes. When I first arrived at the firm after clerking, my assigned mentor was a senior partner with a high end family law practice, which was of course entirely rooted in state law, which I'd never done. And he was very gracious, but we had almost nothing in common. We never worked together. And so that didn't pan out very well, which I suppose happens from time to time, you know, in law firms where they match people. But I did have and end up having two very influential mentors, Buchanan and Ingersoll and Rooney, both of whom eventually left the firm to become United States District Judges here in the Western District of Pennsylvania. So first I was recruited to the firm by Art Schwab, and for the first four or five years, I really cut my teeth as a young lawyer working with him on commercial litigation cases all around the country. He had a specialty in um, restrictive covenant cases, employment cases, so we did a lot of those. And Art was a great teacher, uh, and that was a tremendous learning experience. I remember I took my first deposition when I'd been at the firm for about I don't know, six or eight months. He came, Art came to me around mid-morning one day and said that he was supposed to take a deposition that afternoon. But for I can't remember. For some reason, he was unable to do it, so he asked me to do it. And I said, I've, I've never taken a deposition. I've never even seen a deposition I have no idea what to do. And he said, well, you have a few hours to figure it out. Just let me know how it goes. <laughs> so that was sort of funny. But um, he was appointed to the district court by President um, George W. Bush in 2002, and he's now a senior judge here in Pittsburgh. And then my other mentor was Mark Hornack. And Mark and I had very different politics, but we hit it off right from the start. 
Um, and I considered him one of my best friends at the firm. He had a successful First Amendment practice, which was how I got into doing that work because he graciously brought me in and gave me a lot of responsibility. Uh, and um, we just ended up doing a lot of work together. We're both kind of wonkish and history buffs, um, and that relationship just happened naturally. So um, he was eventually appointed to the district court by President Obama in 2011, uh, and he's now the chief judge here. It sounds like you certainly had some phenomenal mentors uh, along the way for you. And while you were in private practice, you, you were also included on the best lawyers in America list. We have a lot of listeners who are either law students or young lawyers just starting out in their careers. What advice would you give them that you wish you had had when you were just starting out as an attorney? I think I'd say two things. First, um, all lawyers, not just young lawyers, but all of us have two types of clients, internal clients and external clients if you're in a firm of any size. Internal clients are your other colleagues in the firm who entrust their clients to you or ask you to help them with you know matters that arise outside of their practice areas. And so winning your colleagues' confidence ensures that you'll always have some internal clients, which is good for you, it's good for the firm. And then the second thing uh, I would say to young lawyers is that it's never too early to start developing business. That's a whole separate discussion, but you know, the specific advice, advice I would give is just to not wait too long to begin working on that part of your practice. Well, thank you so much for that advice. Uh, and so now you're a judge. You've since left private practice. Uh, I have to imagine that's that's a pretty big transition. Um, so what has that transition been like, You know, going from private practice for a number of years into now being a circuit court judge. It was it was pretty easily pretty easy. I would say actually, the, um, it helped that I clerked, so I had that memory of being on the other side, and the experience of sifting through briefs and trial records, and then writing opinions, which is what we do here. And the fact that I was appointed to a court of appeals, I think, made it easier because pretty much all we do is read and write. And um, that was always my favorite part about practicing law, so it was easy to make the transition. I think it would have been harder as a new district judge because the chamber's work is punctuated by trials and pretrial conferences, and you know it's just more moving parts. Um, and my transition, I, I would say, was made relatively easy because of the kindness and collegiality of my colleagues here on the Third Circuit and elsewhere. When, when I was awaiting, in a the, in the couple weeks awaiting final confirmation, um, I made two visits to circuit judges that I have known for a long time. My chief judge here, Brooke Smith, and Alice Batchelder on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, who I know you've interviewed before. Her chambers are in Medina, Ohio. And on both of those visits, I took several pages of single-spaced questions and asked them every you know, rookie question I could think of, and they patiently answered those questions and offered lots of practical advice from their many years of being judges. Judge Batchelder was a bankruptcy judge, a federal district judge. She's been on the Court of Appeals for almost 30 years. Um, Chief Judge Smith was first a state court judge and then became a federal district judge when he was, I think, 36 or 37. And he's been on the Third Circuit since 2002 and the, and the chief here for four years. So he had lots of great insight. And I just spent about half a day with each of them soaking up their wisdom and getting answers to those questions. And then when I joined this court, my colleagues were all tremendously helpful. Um, I had been friends with Tom Hardiman for about 20 or 25 years. And so I knew that I could always call or stop by his chambers anytime I had questions. But Mike Fisher uh, here in Pittsburgh and uh, Patty Schwartz in Newark, Stephanos Bebas in Philadelphia, Joe Greenaway in Newark, Tony Sirica in Philadelphia, they've all been um, very helpful at different times for which I've been grateful. And it's made the transition really easy. Now, you brought up Chief Judge Brooke Smith who for audience members who, who may have uh, not been paying too much attention here, you clerked for Judge Smith when he was a district court judge. Uh, but as you mentioned, he is now 
Chief Judge Smith for the Third Circuit. What is that like serving as a circuit court judge under your old boss? That's been an interesting part about this transition. I wasn't sure really what to expect about that. I sort of knew what it would be like to do the judicial function, but I wasn't sure what it would be like to work with my old boss, Judge, Chief Judge Smith. Um, you know, as all clerks do, I called him judge when I was a clerk, and I continued to call him judge for the next 24 years. So that was a deeply ingrained habit. Um, but as I was about to enter into judicial service, he applied, he replied to an email uh, that I'd sent him one day in which I must have referred to him as judge, as I always did. And he said it was time I started calling him Brooks, as everyone else on the court does. Um, so even though that was a small gesture and inevitable, I suppose, at some point, just receiving that permission was sort of an important event for me, given our prior relationship. But he told me early on that he would not, while I was welcome to call him, he would not be calling me or checking in on me. Uh, and I think that was a wise thing. And I appreciate the space that he's given me to make my own way here. We, you know, we don't, we sometimes we agree a lot, but sometimes we don't and disagreements inevitable in this job. And he knows me well enough to appreciate that. We're not always going to see things exactly the same. And in that respect, we're just like all of the other uh, judges on this court in that we all exercise independent judgment without respect to our personal relationships. So that's been, I, I would say the, the most remarkable thing about working with my old boss is just the sentimental and professional satisfaction of coming full circle. You know, after all these years, it, it's just gratifying to be reunited with one's judge and to get to work with him again 25 years later this time as a colleague. Now, speaking of that uh, relationship between clerks and, and judges, I have to ask, because we've heard a lot on this show from other judges about traditions and outings that, that they have with their law clerks. Um, you know, some go shooting, some drink bourbon. Uh, others have had a tradition of you know, making them run marathons with them. Is there anything in particular now that you as a judge with your, your law clerks that you try to do uh, to foster that relationship with your clerks? Yeah, I've only had two classes of clerks, so we haven't had a lot of time to develop long traditions. But I'll tell you some of the things that we've done so far, that uh, some of which I suspect will turn into traditions. Uh, my first class of I was I was uh, confirmed in mid October, and my first class of clerks arrived in early to mid November. Um, and so they weren't going to turn around and go home for Thanksgiving. So we had them over to our house for Thanksgiving and everyone enjoyed that. And, um, so every year we're going to continue to have the clerks out to my home. Uh, in fact, we're doing that with this year's clerks in about two weeks. They're coming out for a cookout. Uh, and then, you know, the third circuit sits in Philadelphia, even though my chambers are here in Pittsburgh, we sit in Philadelphia and the federal courthouse there literally overlooks Independence Hall. So we've gone over to Independence Hall to bask in the constitutional history there. Last year, Judge Hardiman and I took our clerks to the National Constitution Center, uh, where Jeff Rosen and Sheldon Gilbert graciously gave us a private tour. So I hope to do something like that from time to time. Back here in Pittsburgh, around Christmas time, I'd take them a few blocks up the street to the city county building where we talk about uh, the 1989 case. That some of your listeners might remember uh, Allegheny County against the ACLU. Uh, and that decision held that a crash in a menorah violated the Establishment Clause because it didn't include enough uh, secular holiday decorations like frosty or whatever. And then while we're there, we circle past the county courthouse where there's about an 80 or 90 year old Ten Commandments plaque that was also the source of an establishment clause challenge that I think went to the Third Circuit, but not that one didn't go to the Supreme Court. Um, when we begin the new year, I tell the clerks that I'm available to eat lunch with them whenever they want. So the first class did that on an irregular basis. But, and then we did things like birthdays. But this year's class said they wanted to do it once a week. So every Friday, we sit around the conference table here in my office and have lunch together. And then finally, I got this idea from 
Judge Kevin Newsom on the 11th Circuit. I bought a ping pong table for my chambers so that if any of my clerks like ping pong, which I do, uh, I'm happy to play with them or they can play with each other. And um, I just moved into the new, the renovated chambers. I had been in temporary space. So we just started that. And then the coronavirus lockdown uh, arrived. So the clerks haven't been around much to play. Uh, but during that time, I started playing with some other judges in the courthouse and found that Judge Hardiman and I uh, are pre pretty evenly matched. So that's been fun. I think we'll continue playing. So you heard it here first, folks. The, the Third Circuit has wild ping pong tournaments happening in the courthouse. <laughs> I do have to ask, because you brought up this divide between, you know, Western Pennsylvania with, with Pittsburgh and Eastern Pennsylvania with Philadelphia. As a Philadelphia Eagles fan myself, where do your loyalties lie in that divide? Well, um, I grew up in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which is, you know, closer to Philadelphia and Harrisburg. And the fans there tend to be divided between Philadelphia and Baltimore. But my family's roots are in Pittsburgh or Western Pennsylvania. So my dad and my brother and just my whole family was Pittsburgh fans. So I naturally gravitated towards Pittsburgh. And when I was growing up, the Pirates were really good. And the Steelers were, of course, uh, great teams. So um, my, my loyalties are with this Pittsburgh. Well, I'll, I'll forgive you for that. Uh, on on the podcast <laughs> that that'll that'll be all right. We'll we'll let it slide today. Uh, I do have one final question for you. It's it's a question that we ask all of our guests here on SCOTUS One Hundred and One, and that is if you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, living or dead, who would it be, and what would you talk about? Yeah, so I knew that question was coming, and it was fun to think through the great. The candidates, but I decided to go with a justice who's not actually that well known for his work on the court, but he is for other reasons, and that's the first Chief Justice John Jay. Uh, he served on the Supreme Court when it was still basically a circuit riding court, and which had to be brutal, schlepping around on horseback for weeks and months at a time away from your home and family. And then because the court was – and all of the federal courts were, were newly constituted, there just weren't that many blockbuster cases during his tenure. The most famous was probably Chisholm against Georgia, and, and Chief Justice Jay voted with the majority to exercise the court's jurisdiction in a suit against Georgia, notwithstanding that state's lack of consent. And then, of course, that was promptly overturned by the 11th Amendment. So it's not as though he's left a great jurisdiction. You know, jurisprudential legacy. But I would love to talk with him not so much about his tenure on the court, but because of all the other remarkable things he did in the service of our country. About 10 or 15 years ago, his modern biography, Walter Starr, came to Pittsburgh and gave a talk about John Jay. And I had never, you know, I hadn't paid much attention to Jay. Mm -hmm. He was sort of a, one of the second tier of founders rather than the first tier of. Uh, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, you know, Madison. But he served in the first and second Continental Congress and was president of the Continental Congress for a time. During the war, he was minister, minister to Spain and then in Paris, where together with Wash with uh, Franklin and Adams, he negotiated the uh, uh, Treaty of Paris, ending the war. And then he came home and served as Secretary for Foreign Affairs in the first years of the new country's existence. And then, of course, he teamed up with Hamilton and Madison to help write the Federalist Papers, some of them, and helped to navigate the proposed Constitution to ratification. He stood with Washington on the balcony at Federal Hall in New York as Washington was inaugurated first president. And then he returned to England and negotiated what we know now as Jay's Treaty, and that was important because it prevented another war with England at a time when we were still recovering from the first war and getting our sea legs, as it were, as a new nation. And then he returned from England and founded the New York Manumission Society to work for the end of slavery and then was elected governor of New York. So he had incredi an incredibly full life and maybe isn't given quite the regard that he should have as one of our founding fathers, but I think it would be fascinating to sit with him and even though we probably wouldn't spend much time talking about his tenure on the court, I think we'd have a lot to talk about. 
Judge, well, thank you so much for for joining us today and for giving our audience a a chance to get to know you uh, just a little bit better. Uh, You've you've been a phenomenal guest and we appreciate having you on and and taking the time to really break down your your career and the, the mentors and the lessons you've learned along the way. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Well, that's our interview with Judge David Porter, uh, who we, again, very much appreciate joining us on our show. Next up, I get to stump Amy with some textualism trivia. All the trivia this week will be about textualism. Amy, first question. Are you ready? I don't know. This this sounds like a hard topic. All right, let's do it. Okay. The word textualism first appeared in what 1952 Supreme Court case? Oh, man, you're bringing me all the way back to law school with this one. Um, I believe, I believe the answer is Youngstown Sheet and Tube. uh, That is correct. That is that is correct. Do you know which justice wrote the word textualism in his opinion? Okay. Um, Hint, it was a concurring opinion. But that's not much of a hint because I think there were five in that case. Oh, man. I I have no idea. Okay. It was Robert Jackson. And in okay. fact, he used the term textualism in a sort of derogatory way. Let's see. Besides Justices Scalia and Thomas, this particular circuit court judge uh, is credited with giving textualism a lot of its intellectual heft. Is this a, a current circuit court judge? I believe so. Oof. This is embarrassing. I actually don't know the answer to I this. I can give you a hint. That would be fantastic. Uh, he is on the Seventh Circuit. He is one of the titans of the Seventh Circuit. I'm embarrassing myself, GC. <laughs> it's Judge Frank Easterbrook. Uh, see, if I had just given an educated guess there, I would have I would have prevented myself from being embarrassed. <laughs> well, you did well. You still did very well. Was that one well, one for three? I think so. I think You're so. Batting, batting 330 is not bad. Yeah, that's fair. Well, folks, that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to SCOTUS 101. Be sure to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. And please, please, please be sure to leave us a five-star rating. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at SCOTUS101 and email us at SCOTUS101 at heritage.org with your questions, comments, or ideas for future shows. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Amy Swear and Giancarlo Canaparo. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and John Pop. For more information, visit heritage.org.